Hello and good morning. I'm Mount Vernon District Supervisor Dan Stork and thank you for joining me today. I know many of you are concerned in this rapidly evolving time and have many questions about the Cronus epidemic and pandemic, county operations and school closings. So I'm hosting my second town meeting of the year to share what we know and more importantly, hear from you. I want to point out that like many newscasts you see lately, we are properly distanced more than six feet apart and have a skeleton crew in the studio with us. We will be dividing this program into two sections. First, we'll, we will talk to Dr. Gloria Aruyensu to hear the latest on the COVID-19 in our community and how you can protect yourself. During this segment, we will take questions regarding the county operations and any questions you have for Dr. Gloria. Following that discussion, I will be joined by my partner in our, our Team MVD, Mount Vernon District School Board Member and Board Chair Karen Corbett Sanders and School Superintendent Dr. Scott Braybrand to hear the latest on school operations, distance learning, graduation, and many questions you have for them. We are all looking forward to answering your questions. If you have questions, you can call 703-324-1114 or submit your questions to the Mount Vernon District email inbox Mount Vernon at fairfaxcounty.gov. Or submit your questions by messaging me on Facebook page at Supervisor Dan Stork or on Twitter at Dan Stork. Thank you all for, and our first responders for, and medical workers for your essential work that you've done for us and our essential businesses that have stayed open and everyone else on the front lines. I would like to tell you a little bit about what is going on in the county and the Mount Vernon district. At both the county and district levels, we are hard at work identifying ways we can help individuals, businesses, nonprofits, and service organizations. The county government remains open to provide support and services to our community in this time of great stress and need. Many resources have been identified and made available on my website, www.fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash Mount Vernon, or you can go directly to the county website and we will continue to look for more ways we can help. In February, the county executive presented his proposed FY 2021 budget. Based on the anticipated financial impacts of the coronavirus, both the increase in need to fund services and the projected decrease in revenues, county staff is revising the proposed budget. We've already identified and set aside $11 million from the third quarter uh, fiscal year 2020 budget review and a reserve to mitigate the impacts of the corona pandemic. County agencies have also been directed to limit expenses to those of a critical nature. A revised proposed FY 2021 budget will be presented on April 7th, and you'll have opportunities to provide public testimony as always. This year we'll be encouraging video and written testimony, although in-person testimony will be an option for those who choose. More information on the various ways to provide budget comments will be provided in the coming days. Next, Fairfax County Chairman Jeff McKay, who is unable to be, join us today, but we'll have a brief message from him now. Good morning. I'm Jeff McKay, Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, and wanted to thank you for participating in today's virtual town hall meeting. I also want to thank Mount Vernon District Supervisor Dan Stork and Mount Vernon District School Board Member and Chairman of the School Board Karen Corbett Sanders for putting this production on this morning. I'm sorry that I can't join you uh, live during the presentation, but I did want to share with you some important information about what we're doing in Fairfax County. Uh, you will get an update on COVID-19 uh, as a part of today's virtual town hall meeting, as well as an update on the county budget. Our board recently had a budget committee meeting where we discussed the economic impacts of COVID-19 on Fairfax County. Rest assured that our board is actively managing the situation, both from a public health standpoint, as you will hear, but also from a budgetary standpoint. The county executive will put out a revised budget on April 7th uh, next week. And we hope that folks can have an opportunity to review that and participate in our budget process. As a part of the budget public hearings, we will allow a lot of remote participation, videos to be recorded ahead of time, uh, telephone calls, in-person testimony, which uh, hopefully uh, we can discourage uh, people from making in-person testimony, but we will provide that outlet to make sure that we get 
the public input that we need on this budget. Clearly, the original county executive's budget has been overtaken by the last few weeks of the COVID-19 crisis. Our board will continue to actively manage the budget and the numbers and put resources into combating this public health crisis. Again, thank you for joining us today and thank you Supervisor Stork and thank you School Board Chair Karen Corbett Sanders for this virtual town hall meeting and know that my office is always ready and willing to assist the residents of Fairfax County in any way we can. Thank you. And I want to thank Chairman McKay and county leadership for their hundreds of hours of efforts over the past month as, as they've helped to steer us in, in a wonderful direction to try to manage this crisis. I also want to remind people that you can email your questions to us at mtvernon, that's Mount Vernon at fairfaxcounty.gov. In Mount Vernon, we have fully engaged with our nonprofits and faith-based service providers and are proactively working together to solve extraordinary demands. Get help, give help. We are also developing initiatives to support our local and small businesses to see how we can help them. While we are under this stay at home order, please consider supporting nonprofits, our service organizations, and local businesses. In a way, you can order takeout, buy gift cards, donate food, make donations to employee funds, Frankly, anything you can do will be, help, will be helpful and appreciated. We have created a Get Help, Give Help webpage as an easy resource for those who are in need of assistance and those who are looking for ways to help out. Now I'd like to welcome my first guest this morning, Fairfax County Health Department Director, Dr. Gloria Aduensu, and um, Thank you very much for joining me today. And, and if you could first give us an update, a brief update on the coronavirus in Fairfax County. Thank you, Supervisor Stork. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. As we've all heard on the news, the outbreak um, of this new coronavirus continues to grow. Um, there is over a million people worldwide now who have been reported as having um, been confirmed as cases including over 270,000 people here in the United States. Um, the different areas in the United States are experiencing different levels of COVID-19 activity. Um, some areas actually are experiencing um, community transmission. And here in Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health is um, reporting widespread widespread community transmission, which means that um, there are parts of the, um, of the Commonwealth where um, disease is spreading in communities, including here in Fairfax County, where we have to date over 372 um, cases um, out of the 2,000 cases that have been reported in Virginia. And unfortunately, we have had five deaths to date. Um, what the health department is doing is investigating every case that is reported to us with the goal of um, identifying individuals who may have come in contact with the case so that we can provide guidance and enact public health measures that would limit further spread within the community. In addition, um, we've had um, recently the uh, governor's stay-at-home um, um, stay stay at home order, um, as well as yesterday, CDC's new guidance on face coverings for people who are in public settings who are um, in, and in settings where it is not possible to maintain the social distancing of six feet and so on. Um, all of these guidances and are intended to complement and not replace the public health messages that we have continuously given to everyone to cover coughs and sneezes, to um, practice um, social distancing within six feet, wash hands frequently and thoroughly, and then to stay home when sick. Thank you. Well, I think those basic messages, if uh, I think in some ways, if folks haven't heard them by now, I'm not sure what planet they're living on, but, but the, the challenge we have is 
not everybody is complying with that. I, I think that's part of our, our real, and I'm sure one of your ongoing efforts is to help people understand why it's, it's so important. Yes, definitely. You know, it, it is, I think the message is too simple for people to believe its, its impact. It is when done routinely mm -hmm. and consistently, it is the most effective tool mm -hmm. we have at, mm -hmm. at uh, preventing um, disease from, you know, running wild within our community. We, um, one of the questions that our office has been hearing about a lot from residents is, why are we not getting information about the number of cases in like the Mount Vernon district or have that information by zip code? Another question we're getting quite frequently is, when, there, when will there be a COVID-19 testing at Anova Mount Vernon? Since um, three driveway, three drive-through um, test sites have been identified last week, people are getting the impression there is no testing in Mount Vernon. Our office is letting those who ask uh, to know that there is testing available at Nova Mount Vernon. It's just not a drive-through testing. What else can you tell people about getting tested that might, I guess, give them understanding about how they go about doing that and maybe relieve a little bit of their stress about how do I, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm okay? So it is true that testing has presented a lot of challenges to, um, to, to our communities. First of all, starting from the fact that um, only CDC could actually do the, perform the testing. And so mm -hmm. that created bottlenecks and, um, and, they have, and, and wasn't available to all. And since then, um, state laboratories have also um, been engaged um, with the testing. And um, more recently, commercial labs mm -hmm. have also come into the picture. Mm -hmm. um, however, the challenge still remains that there is a national shortage of things like mm -hmm. um, the PPE or the, and that, or the respirators that healthcare providers need to safely um, obtain specimen. Mm -hmm. There's also a shortage of the um, specimen collection kits, as well as the reagents that mm -hmm. the labs need to process all the specimen. And so as a result of that, um, for example, to be able to um, receive testing, you need to have been evaluated by your clinician, um, your primary care mm -hmm. doctor. So if your primary care doctor evaluates you, um, there are certain criteria that he or she would be following in, in, um, in, um, of, in ordering the tests for you. It's not mm -hmm. for everyone. Most, mm -hmm. the, the good news is that most people who um, come down with COVID illness are not um, going to be severely ill and they can self-manage at home. But we recommend that people who have worsening symptoms, including shortness of breath, mm -hmm. um, seek care from a medical provider. And, and then testing will be done and follow up and so on. Um, the testing at, is also um, available at the state lab. However, that is reserved for um, a certain in high priority groups of people. We're talking about healthcare workers and oh. first responders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're talking about patients who are in hospital, who are hospitalized, oh, sure. as well as um, patients who live in um, nursing homes, um, assisted living facilities, mm -hmm. and other congregate settings such as um, jails and, and, and um, um, shelters and so on because of the way of how easily disease can spread within mm -hmm. these um, these closed settings, and the fact that these settings tend to have vulnerable populations, and so the testing challenge um, continues, but it is improving as more and more mm -hmm. um, um, areas are open. In Northern Virginia, here um, mm -hmm. there are a few sites. You mentioned Inova. Mm -hmm. Inova has three sites that have. Uh, that, you know, that are offering the testing at their urgent care centers. Um, there is also Kaiser Permanente, mm -hmm. um, has two sites in Northern Virginia, I think one in Woodbridge and another in Tyson's, where this is available. And um, there is a um, pediatric practice called PM Pediatrics on Lee Highway that is also offering testing for their pediatric patients mm -hmm. only. I have to say that, um, the yes, so so that's that's that, and then the the last one is um, the federally qualified health centers, 
We have oh. two federal, mm -hmm. federally qualified health centers in um, Fairfax, Neighborhood Health, as well as HealthWorks, and both are offering testing for their patients on an appointment basis. Would that include the neighborhood health center on Richmond Highway That's as correct. well? That's the, correct. The neighborhood center, um, the neighborhood health clinic on Richmond Highway mm -hmm. is one of those centers where testing is being offered. And just so folks know where that is, that's, that's at the uh, really the Beacon Mall area. It's, it's at um, uh, next door to the fire station as well as in, for those of us who are a little bit older, it's, it's the former Metro Call building. So it's a pretty distinguishable building right mm -hmm. at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. we, I know we have some questions from the audience. Um, I would like to go to those at this point. Supervisor Stork, we have an email question that we received from Catherine. Which land use, rezoning, et cetera, projects for the Mount Vernon District are you going to request move forward now? For example, the Huntington Phase 3 development. Well, um, the chairman, really with the, the board's support, has uh, identified that we need to stay focused on really our primary efforts right now, which are um, minimizing our meetings and minimizing the exposure of the, the, the many support people who help to make our meetings possible, um, as well as we need to um, reduce the number of land use cases because each one of those requires a public hearing. And with the public hearing, you're introducing more people and, and more um, uh, testimony into one of our meetings. So the, the, the approach we've used is if there's a particular land use decision that requires uh, more time um, and, and it is more urgent. Uh, those are being identified um, through the supervisor's offices and we're in turn sharing that with the, the chairman and, and making that part of the schedule. Right now, we, we don't have uh, this particular site as part of the schedule because it's not been identified as one that's ready for uh, public hearing. Dr. Gloria, this is actually a follow-up from what you all were just discussing. The first question was, where are the testing sites in our area? And I think you've addressed that. But her follow-up, the follow-up question from Sarah on email was, do you, if you have a primary care physician in DC, can you still get a prescription to be tested in Virginia? And what types of tests are available locally and how long does it take to receive the results? So the requirement for testing is just receiving, as, as having a referral. Doesn't really matter where the referrals are coming from. And um, so that's a requirement for testing. Um, the, um, can you tell me the second half of that question again? I'm sorry. Um, what types of tests are available locally and how long does it take to receive it? So testing, how long it takes really depends on the lab. It's taking anywhere from a few days to up to a week, uh, it's my understanding. And um, the testing that is currently here is the PCR test that is um, used to detect pieces of genetic material of the virus within a person, um, within specimen that are obtained from a person's um, throat and back of, you know, it's called a nasopharyngeal um, um, test where they put a probe through your nose to the back of your throat and then collect a piece of genetic material and put it in a liquid tube, send it to the lab, and then the lab does the PCR testing to detect the, the genetic material. Another question on testing. Why is it, this is from Claire on email, why is it possible to get testing without a prescription in Fredericksburg but not in Fairfax County? I don't, I don't know why. I really don't have an answer to that. The, recommend, the way it's done, here in many parts of the National Capital Region is that people see their primary care provider who then assesses the patient to see what it is that they have. You know, not all respiratory illnesses are COVID. We just are on the edge, uh, on the downswing of uh, flu season. Um, many of the tests that um, have been performed have actually come back negative for COVID. So I did mention earlier that um, Virginia has 2,000 um, positive confirmed cases out of about 19,000 tests that have been performed. So it's important for um, a person who is having upper respiratory symptoms, if it's not COVID, 
for them to be able to know what it is that is wrong with them so that they could have the appropriate um, care, which is why that interim step of seeing a provider who can then rule out other things and if they suspect it still is COVID, then give you that last step of getting the, the COVID test. Another question from email from Kathy. What is the status at Mount Vernon Hospital now? What is the anticipated need there and are there plans to provide additional beds there if needed? Is there anything that we can do to help the staff at Mount Vernon? So in terms of hospital search capacity, the um, hospitals in the UNOVA system as well as hospitals throughout the Northern Virginia have for a long time been looking at search capacity um, as it relates to pan pandemics. And they have built internal search capacity um, measures, which allows them to surge up to like 70% within the hospitals. So there have been mo a number of models um, that are being looked at to look at the uh, ability of the search capacity needs um, um, w to, to look at the, um, the effectiveness of, these, of, of the search capacity uh, measures that are within our community. And um, you know, the measures that we're currently taking in terms of the stay home, um, st the stay at home measures, and all the other public health um, social distancing and other personal and, and, co and environmental measures that are currently in place are intended to prevent the rapid exponential growth of cases and um, so and you know flatten the curve as, you've, as we've all, mm -hmm. we have always heard um, um, it say it, it said um, with the goal of decreasing the numbers so that hospitals are not overwhelmed and can um, optimize the care that they need, that every patient needs, um, so they don't have to rush in in terms of ventilators or whatever. So, so that's the strategy um, that is ongoing right now. And we hope that all these additional measures that are being put in place are able to, is able to slow that curve. We have a question from Diane on Facebook, actually two questions. Does the health department notify the public or specific customers when an employee of an essential business tests COVID positive for COVID-19? And can mosquitoes transmit the COVID-19 virus? So I'll answer the second question first because um, it's, it is easier. To date, it has not, there is, uh, mosquitoes are not a known vector for spreading um, COVID. The, it is spread through respiratory secretions. When a person is standing within six feet of another person who is infected. And so when that infected person speaks, droplets that comes out of the mouth or when they cough, um, is then could directly hit the, the, the person in front of them um, and infect them. Or the droplets can drop onto a surface, such as a table or you know elevator button or whatever, and then when a person goes back and touches those surfaces, they can um, reinfect um, the, themselves. They can actually infect themselves. Um, Supervisor Stork, we have a question from Susan on Facebook. A salesman went door to door for four hours claiming he was essential, possibly infecting an entire neighborhood. Can you address this and get gov the governor and media to alert people to the possible dangers of this? Uh, I'd be happy to respond. The, I'm not aware of the specifics uh, with the person who's going door to door, but in general, our police have been uh, very responsive to anybody who has questions or concerns about social distancing and whether or not they're an essential business. So I would urge the, the person to call the, the uh, non-emergency police number. Uh, that's probably the best way to do that. We have, we have a phone call, and can we bring a phone call in? Yes. Hello. Hello. Welcome Hi. to the Mount Vernon, virtual Mount Vernon town meeting. Hi, I was asking if, um, will we be able to get COVID-19 stats by area, 
or a zip code? Dr. Should Lord, I yes, please. So the answer is no, and the reason is because there is community-wide community transmission going on. A case only represents um, a, pl a place of residence and not necessarily where transmission is going on. So providing that information will create a false sense of security for members of our community, thinking that there are more cases in a certain part of Fairfax versus the other, um, and be complacent, and, and as opposed to um, being vigilant about maintaining all the public health um, recommendations that we have instituted and, re and are recommending so far. So, so that's the reason why um, zip code by zip code um, information is not, is, is, is not going to be done. Um, if I can give an example, sure, let's say a certain zip code area has 10 cases, but all of them are occurring in a long-term care facility. And there's another um, zip code that has similar case, number of cases, 10 cases, but all 10 cases are in the community and there is no, public health has not been able to make a link. On the surface, it might look like both um, mm -hmm. scenarios are the same, when in fact, the second scenario of having the 10 cases in, within the community that, 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 that for which there is no um, epi link is a more um, concerning situation than the 10 in the um, long-term care facility. So well, maybe to get at the kind of the question from the caller is, is, is there a way if, if a community has seems to have more community spread cases, is there a way to, to urge more heightened um, uh, stay, you know, social distancing and, and surface cleansing, then there may, um, then maybe there would be without it. So we know certain parts of the country have had many more cases. I think people are more hyper focused on that. Um, whereas other parts of the country where it's been less of an issue, people maybe aren't quite as diligent, not quite as focused. I think maybe part of the caller's question is: Is there, is it appropriate, or is there something that we could or should do if certain parts of Fairfax County seem to have more um, intensive community spread versus a more focused. So, so by definition, a pandemic um, occurs when we have a new virus for mm -hmm. which there is no immunity. There's no one in, the, in our population is immune to, to this virus. And so everyone is susceptible and everyone is at risk of becoming sick if they were to become infected. And so the intent is or the focus is for everyone to practice those measures to prevent disease from spreading, as opposed to um, watch, trying to track where, where, where the disease is. And because you just don't know, somebody from an area where the zip code data shows that there isn't a lot of transmission, could you could be in that area, but then meet somebody from another area where there's mm -hmm. high transmission and not know that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not where you are, it's the human behavior, which is why mm -hmm. a lot of the, um, the public health measures are focusing on individual behavior. Yeah. It's about everybody yeah. covering your coughs yeah. and your sneezes, no matter mm -hmm. where you are, everyone washing your hands frequently, mm -hmm. no matter where you are, and everyone staying home when you're sick, no matter where you are. This disease is transmitted through human behavior and not necessarily where you are living or standing mm -hmm. um, because, as I said, everyone is susceptible and will come down with disease if exposed. I, I appreciate the intensity and the determination I saw on your face and, and heard in your voice as you were saying that because I know we, um, we all have a tendency to, to let our guard down at times and, and what I hear from you as our health department leader and really our, our, the core person who's leading us through this crisis is saying we cannot let down. We have to stay focused. We have to be diligent uh, throughout. We have another phone call that uh, we want to bring in. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Claire. Um, now that they're recommending that you wear masks or cloth coverings over your face, will the fabric store at Beacon Hill be allowed to open again? Dr. Gloria. 
I think we understood the question was, now that we can wear masks, it should be a little bit easier to get out in the public and, and I mean, go to some of the stores that we have need to shop in or get uh, merchandise from. Uh, why not? Why can't we now open this up a little bit more? So the, um, the, the um, what do you call it, the mouth coverings that are being um, recommended for everyone to use is yet another layer of, of um, uh, public health um, prevention me methods for individuals who may not necessarily know that they are um, infected and are transmitting virus and preventing that from spreading. The, this is just one of many other uh, measures that are currently in place. And as I said earlier, all of these measures have come together to try to slow the exponential um, growth of of, of new cases and to um, put a little bit of, um, uh, 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 of, a, of a halt in that upward trajectory so that um, hospitals do not become overwhelmed. We've just now instituted all of these measures. It takes a while. There's a, always a lag between when um, these measures begin to see a downhill in terms of number of cases mm -hmm. because people have already been infected already mm -hmm. And it, as you know, this takes, um, in, after an infection, um, you have up to two, 14 days to actually come down with mm -hmm. illness. So this um, cascade of events will continue, to conti will continue in, our, in, our, in our community, even, when, even though we have this new, these new recommendations in place. The, questions, uh, the, the caller's question is about, I, I think, uh, is pointing to the fact that as these, um, the stay, Order, the stay-at-home order and all these recommendations are eventually lifted, they will have to be lifted in a um, way that keeps the goal of all the social distancing measures that I have alluded to, which is not overwhelming the health system. It's going to be a very tricky act mm -hmm. um, yeah. that public health officials watch and calibrate very carefully yeah. so that we don't have an upward swing. Why? Because as I said earlier, all of us are susceptible. This is a new virus. And the minute we open up, we will start seeing the upward swing again. So um, at this point, the goal is really to seize all possible transmissions from happening and to then look at its impact on our community, and especially in our hospital settings. And I don't know what the politicians and, uh, and sure. the people in, in mm -hmm. um, CDC and so on, as our federal government works with, with CDC and other public health, um, um, eight, with other public health um, leaders, to look at a strategy for which these um, restrictions are, are released. When the right time is. We have, an, we have, have another phone call. You're on, please. Yeah, this is Cl Claire again. I wanted to know about that specific store so that we can buy supplies to make masks because, you know, fabric is not available in grocery stores. So I think, yeah, to please. yes, and sorry if, if I misunderstood that question. The answer to that is that, you know, it doesn't have to be any special fabric. It could be a bandana, it could be a scarf, it could be anything that you have that you can use to just, it's about covering your nose and your mouth, something that can mm -hmm. do a, have a good seal okay. around, around your face, um, your nose and your mouth, mm -hmm. and under your chin. That's all is needed. So it would be nice if um, you know, people who like to sew could get you know, f special fabric to make this, but I think everybody in America has something in their house that they can use to cover their mouths and their noses. So in this case, for the mask, the, really any type of fabric would be is useful and, and don't have to necessarily have some new fabric in order to be able to make those masks. No. I, I realize there may be other reasons that, that clearly you're interested in going to the fabric store, but if the core of that is on the masks and how to make them, and I know that uh, at least at our house, uh, my wife uh, got her sewing machine out and she's been sewing away and 
She had a whole bunch of fabrics that, that frankly, were we, that had kind of worn out, had their useful life was gone, but the parts of it could still work very well. And she's sewn them together, and we've been using that um, and, and giving those out to folks that we know as well. So uh, you can make a difference, and you can help folks in that way, for sure. We have another email question from Sharon. Any this is for Dr. Gloria. Any suggestions on those in the high-risk categories getting home grocery delivery so they don't have to go out? So that is a good um, um, thing for people who are in high-risk categories. We're talking about the elderly, people with underlying medical conditions. And fortunately, I think, you know, during this new phase um, of our time, and these unprecedented times, we become very creative. Many um, food establishments that previously didn't do, um, you know, or deliveries are getting into the delivery business. There are already um, other um, um, businesses that will deliver food for you and so on. Um, so I think because of that, people in high risk um, situations, um, people who had high risk of severe disease from COVID should take advantage of these, um, transport, these delivery mechanisms and stay home as much as they can. And if, if um, they're not able to find somebody to deliver those goods or they're, they're not sure if the, the uh, organization is supporting them, um, my advice to them is to let us know. I mean, we have a, we have a website that says uh, Give Help, Get Help. Um, so if it's Get Help, it's something you're looking to, to get, need some assistance with, you're welcome to go there and, and click on that. Or the other alternative is just to send us an email at mtvernon, that's Mount Vernon, at fairfaxcounty.gov, and we'll be happy to work with you and work with a vendor to, to connect the two of you together and hopefully make a difference for you. Keep you healthy. Supervisor Stork, we have an email question from Greg. Several nights ago, a police cruiser slowly drove through our neighborhood with flashing blue lights. They were not the emergency lights. Never saw this on display before. Were they cruising through to see if neighbors were properly social distancing? And, and Greg, I had, the, I had the same experience uh, three nights ago. Um, I was driving home and ready to enter my neighborhood, and I saw a police cruiser that had just turned into my neighborhood. The blue, light, blue lights were on, and I was trying to figure out what that was. Uh, I ended up following um, the police car through my neighborhood and saw them exit. And then I realized that that's probably what it was. And since that time, we've put that in our newsletter and we're hopefully, and I know the police are getting the word out that that's all part of just showing visibility, letting folks know that they're in the community, they're engaged, they're here to make a difference. If there's something that you need, you know, you're welcome to come out and flag them down. They're obviously will maintain the, the appropriate social distancing, but they're, they're gonna be happy to help. But, our public safety people are here to serve us, and they've been doing a fantastic job. Uh, not only our, our police, but clearly our first responders. So uh, if you have a need, always use the non-emergency number. They, we can put that at the bottom of the screen. But regardless, um, let them know, and, and frankly, share your thanks, because uh, we are deeply grateful for not only their work, but obviously the work of our health department uh, employees who have been working nonstop for now months because of the amount of effort it's taken to really to truly get us where we are today with the preparation and even the, the planning and, and how now do we make sure that we can execute the, the plans that you all have been putting together. Yeah. We have a phone call. Uh, yes, uh, this is um, Patricia I'm calling from Mount Vernon area and I have a question for the doctor and, prop and also for you. Um, I'm retired law enforcement federal and I have relatives who are first responders uh, relatives in the sheriff's office, Fairfax County, also uh, nurses who are on the front line. My concern is um, what I've been trying to determine is if there's any uh, consolidated effort to try to get, you know, we're talking about masks for the public, but my concern is having enough uh, protective equipment for our first responders and our front line um, health officials. And is there any kind of coordinated effort to get those to them? I've been on the phone this week, actually, with different companies throughout the country, trying to see what kind of sources there may be. But I don't know if they're on the agency level that they're doing that. And um, I'm here to help. And I think there are many people 
in the community. I know several ladies who are willing to make um, masks and so forth. Now, they're not the quality of the mask that is needed for the front line, but doctor, can you, can you address that and what we can do to help and if there's some coordinated uh, avenue that we can go through to provide volunteer opportunities for that? So thank you for your offer. Um, I, I'm, I'm, it's so heartwarming to find so many people within mm -hmm. our community who are looking to do something to help. Um, the one avenue that we are asking people to go through is um, through the Office of Emergency Management to see mm -hmm. who they are collecting information on all mm -hmm. kinds of um, um, resources that community members are bringing to our attention. Um, I don't have the phone number for that, but if you go through our published, the Health Department's published call center line, which is online, you can be, mm -hmm. you may be able to be, um, they will direct you to the, um, to that OEM resource. Um, so well, one of the things that the, um, co the face covering recommendation that CDC has put out f with is, that's why they, they didn't choose, that's why they chose the words very carefully and didn't use mm -hmm. the word mask, but mm -hmm. a face covering, because as the caller has rightly identified, masks are in short supply. And these are resources that healthcare workers as well as um, uh, people who may be caring for a loved one at home and mm -hmm. so on, mm -hmm. um, will need to protect themselves. And so um, for those, for everyone else who, for whom, the, who, who, for whom they um, should go outside in, in public settings and, and, and need to cover their, their face, you know, their mouths and their noses, a cloth, face piece is, is all that is required. And it's, requi it's, it's also important to use that because it's easily washable. Reusing a mask could be quite dangerous if you don't know how to you know, put it on and, and, and mm -hmm. take it off. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to have a mask, but what they don't realize is that the outside of the mask can actually get contaminated. And if you were to remove your mask by touching the front of the mask and removing it, you will be using your hands uh -huh. to touch the front of yeah, the mask, which sure. is contaminated. Mm -hmm. And then, like we all do without recognizing mm -hmm. it, we're touching our face, we're mm -hmm. touching our eyes and our lips and get contaminated that way. Um, and then the masks are in short supply. So what will people want to do? They might want to reuse it. So the mask is actually, could be dangerous if, if it's not used properly, which is why I like the cloth covering mm -hmm. and because when you take it off, you can throw it in your washing machine mm -hmm. and it's clean and then reuse it mm -hmm. uh, multiple times. Excellent. Uh, we have another phone call. Oh, well, I just want to. Oh, yes. Uh huh. Hello? Hello? Yes, uh, we hear you. My name is Diane. Uh, Diane? Yes, if you have a I'm question. I'm Diane. Yes. I'm waving to you both. I want to tell you something. Your, your Meals on Wheels for Fairfax people like myself are very helpful. And I think you ought to justify them or let them know that they're doing a great job for us as citizens. Thank you. I appreciate the Meals on Wheels uh, drivers. The people who are delivering that are really doing just amazing work. And, and I know keeping people healthy as well as uh, safer by being able to provide that food in their home. Did you have a question for us? Yeah, um, can you tell me also what's the requirements to get it sometimes? Oh, I see. The requirements for the Meals on Wheels program. Yeah. Um, Dr. Gouley, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, I don't know, but I know that we have a, a website that can provide that information. And if you send us uh, if you send us an email, we would be happy to follow up with you today and, and make sure that you get that information. Uh, I'd, off the top of my head, I don't know what, I, I'm, I know it's related to a disability and sometimes age, but without that specific information, I probably wouldn't be able to help you regardless. But if you send an email to mtvernon at fairfaxcounty.gov, that's mountvernon at fairfaxcounty.gov, 
we'll be happy to follow up and, and find out what the eligibility is and, and help you. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something else that I like. Fairfax really does help people like myself. My husband died September 28, 2019. I'm very I'm sorry to hear that. I'm having a hard time with it. People here are really helpful. Excellent. They do a lot of good work. Well, thank you. Thank you for your call. You're welcome. Dr. Gloria, we have another question from email from Mark. Given what New York Governor Cuomo tells us daily, that the virus will reach other cities and overwhelm public health systems, how many hospital beds do the 1.1 million residents of Fairfax County have access to? Perhaps 3,500? Additionally, how many ventilators do we have at Inova Mount Vernon and how many ventilators countywide? So unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question. The Virginia Department of Health is currently working with the Virginia Hospital Alliance to collect that information. What I do know is that over the years between, over, over the years since um, 2001, um, hospitals have engaged in search capacity um, um, activities to be able to respond to the um, um, increased number of uh, patients that would ensue as a result of a pandemic and have increased their um, ability to take care of patients by about 70%. And it's not all about having extra beds, but sometimes they have um, put in, um, um, what do you call it? Um, you know, the plugs that you have in, in hospitals for suctioning and 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 so on. They, they have put some of these um, in, hallways in, in, in extra spaces um, within the hospital so that cots and so on could be mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. um, if needed. So I don't have numbers, um, but the, some of the modeling that have um, been done is to look precisely at those numbers and when um, the system would be overwhelmed, which is why these measures, at, these um, community mitigation measures are in place to keep the numbers down so that the hospitals are not overwhelmed. Currently, hospitals are not overwhelmed anywhere in um, Fairfax that I'm aware of. And I'm not aware of even in the, the Washington metro area at this point. I think, and I think that's partly because we've, I think, been in front of this, at least that's in correct. terms of ensuring people keep the social distancing, the stay at home, the number of things. And I, I was wondering if there's even any difference between kind of this metro area versus the rest of Virginia, because we see both data is that part of the conversation that that you're having at a state level is that one part of the area one one metropolitan area within virginia is at a different stage versus another of course northern virginia is acting more like the national capital region as opposed to virginia but we do have um, areas of transmission in for example the um, um, uh, richmond mm -hmm. tidewater area sure. and so on yeah. but as a whole um, we look at ourselves more in line with Northern Virginia simply because, as you know, we live in one place mm -hmm. and socialize in other places, and there's just so much mixing um, of our community across those state lines. Thank you. We have, a, we have an Internet question as well. Dr. Gloria, this is, I think, a little bit of a follow-on what you just said. In, um, in view of the fact that Northern Virginia is so different from most of Virginia, when is COVID-19 expected to peak in Northern Virginia? So, again, models, um, there's few models out there, um, and one of the models from, um, I believe, Michigan had predicted that peak of the, you know, that, that the COVID would peak around May 2nd area, early May. It got shifted a little bit to mid-May, but it really is hard to predict in light of all the measures that are currently um, happening. Um, so that prediction, that um, um, uh, modeling prediction did not, for example, put into um, account the stay-at-home order that we currently have. So there are a lot of um, social distancing uh, measures that, have, that we are currently um, um, abiding by, which is putting a lot of pressure on transmission and will therefore um, move the peak you know, further out, as well as flatten the peak. Excellent. 
We have uh, we have another phone call. Yes. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if I could ask a question about how to take care of our groceries when we purchase them. Do we need to wash the fruits and vegetables? Certainly. Um, even when we don't have a COVID, COVID mm -hmm. pandemic, I, I would hope that we are all washing our, our, our fruits and vegetables when we purchase them from the, from, from the grocery stores, um, simply because um, people, people touch them. Sometimes things fall on the floor and they you know, get put back on the, um, on, on, on the pile. So um, that is good practice. Hand washing and washing of fruits and vegetables is always um, um, highly um, recommended um, because of the spread of diseases, all kinds of diseases, mm -hmm. including COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people don't recognize that a lot of the diseases that spread within our community, norovirus, we, we, before this, we heard a lot about norovirus, sure, yes. um, um, influenza, mm -hmm. um, meningitis, all of these hepatitis, all of these hepatitis A, all of these diseases are spread um, because we don't wash our hands properly. So hand washing and washing of food especially is, is, is of utmost importance. And I understood her question maybe also is that canned goods or, or bags of something that I get that clearly have been handled in the store. Is that something that I should, you know, also, you know, wash or some way or other, you know, remove, you know, the, somebody else having touched them? Is that something I should be overly concerned about or something that... that I, I think the general um, hand washing and, or washing of things that we get from the store is sufficient at this time. Um, it's all about when you're cooking, mm -hmm. you know, washing your hands before and, and, um, and, and doing the similar things that you would do um, in, in in the, in, sorry, I'm, that you would do in the past. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So okay. that those, those, um, there, there is no new guidance as opposed to, um, as it relates to what wiping down your can of tomatoes mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. anything sure. like that. It's about washing your hands um, and opening up whatever you do and, um, and then that should be fine. Thank you. We have another phone call, and then I want to try to bring in our school folks. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, you've, you're at the Hello? virtual Mount Time meeting. Welcome. Hello, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Hey, I'm calling in regard to the county budget, and I know there was uh, speculation on maybe having a 4% increase on uh, real estate taxes and things like that to be able to fully uh, fund programs in the county. Yes, I, I know that the, well, the original um, county executive budget had in it um, whatever increase would, would come from an increase in property values, but there also, uh, he was recommending a three cent uh, rate increase. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what he'll be recommending at this point in time. I know that we are all very aware that uh, money is tight uh, all across the board. I, I will look forward to what he recommends on the 7th when he brings that out. And um, I think we're gonna have to just go from there. There'll be plenty of opportunity um, over the next uh, few weeks after that to, to share your thoughts and, and absolutely communicate them with me and, and other Board of Supervisor members. But um, I, will, I will, like you, be looking uh, forward to, to reading and seeing what the county executive presents on April 7th, and, and from that, we'll, we'll just need to go forward. The, the public hearings will be the following week, so uh, please take a look, and again, you're welcome to, to sign up and uh, either, or just to send uh, directly to us your, your public testimony. One of the things that I did when I got on the Board of Supervisors a little over four years ago is try to increase the ease with which the public can communicate with the Board and give public testimony. And I'm pleased to say that over the last year, we've, we've changed how we accept budget testimony. So you now can literally, it's as simple as taking out your iPhone or taking out your phone, 
uh, recording a, a two or three minute at the most uh, video of, of whatever um, information you want to convey to us, either to, to not to raise taxes or to raise taxes or to fund this program or not fund this program. Um, it's as simple as that, and then you would upload that to the website, and then you literally, that testimony gets shared with us. So looking forward to that. Uh, we will also, um, uh, uh, Chairman of the School Board uh, uh, and I, uh, uh, Karen Corbett-Sanders, uh, we will be hosting a budget uh, town meeting. We haven't set the date for that, so it'll be a virtual town meeting, much like this one, and we look forward to, to sharing and following that, the budget that comes out with the county executive, um, having discussion and dialogue with the community as a whole about that. Thank you. Uh, we have, we have uh, last phone call. Yes, and then, and then we'll go to our, uh, our public school folks. Yes. Hello, this is Tom, and I'm calling to ask uh, the doctor, uh, when we clean fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, what is the best way to do that? We've understood that some people are washing them in a solution of water and like baking soda or something like that. Can you comment on that, please? So washing fruits and vegetables with running water is all that is, is, is plenty. You know, many people don't recognize that, don't realize that it's the actual running of water and rubbing of either your hands or your fruit is what removes the dirt and the germs. So that is sufficient. So it's not necessarily a soap or baking soda or anything else. It's taking that and putting water and having it and then literally wiping it with your hands. And of course, when you're all done with that, you should probably wash your hands. That's correct. So it's about washing it under running water. Mm -hmm. okay. That as you're rubbing your fruit, your vegetables, whatever, your hands, that there's running water to remove the um, dirt and the germs that is, is coming off of it. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you as well. Thank you for calling. We will now take a short break so that our Fairfax County Public School guests can join me in the studio to discuss the status of the schools, and we will be right back. Thank you.
Howdy, this is Dan Stork. I'm out running district supervisor again, and I have on the phone with me uh, our chairman of the school board, Karen Corbett Sanders, and my partner in Mount Vernon district. We want to welcome you back to our town meeting. We're now going to hear about the changes in our school system. As you know, schools have been closed since March 13th, and I know anybody who's a parent especially knows that. Um, and at SP, SP, FCPS, they've been doing a good job of adapting to our rapidly evolving landscape from setting up schools, uh, feed sites or food sites, as well as bus distribution to our neediest students, to accelerating distance learning, figuring out how our seniors will graduate. Wow, uh, my next two guests have their, have their teams have been hard at work. And with that, I'm gonna have ask um, Mount Vernon School Board member and, Mount, and the chair of our school board, Karen Corbett Sanders, to join me. And our superintendent of schools, Dr. Uh, Scott Brabrand. Thank you both for being here today. Dan, thank you so much for having us. Uh, at no other time is it more important to have a one Fairfax view on how we do uh, do business and approach uh, this historic uh, challenge before us, the pandemic of COVID-19. And that one Fairfax um, approach has resulted in um, you know, not only the close relationship between the Board of Supervisors and the school board, 
but between our county services and our um, school system, as well as with our nonprofits. I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Brabrand for being with us today, but more importantly, for the incredibly hard work that he and his leadership team have undertaken since uh, actually prior to March 13 when schools were closed. Since schools have been closed, we have been working first to, uh, to address the most uh, important aspect of our children's lives, which is ensuring that they have food security. And we rolled out a uh, extensive food distribution network, which includes 34 sites as well as bus transportation. And here in the Mount Vernon region, those sites include Bucknell, uh, Cameron Elementary, Edison High School, Fort Belvoir Elementary, Hybla Valley, Lorton Station, Mount Vernon Woods, South County High School, the Audubon, Audubon uh, Trailer Park, Gum Springs, and Mount Eagle Elementary School. We are constantly reevaluating and making sure that uh, we do whatever is possible to reach the needs of these students. Just yesterday, we served 20,000 students and overall we served 210,000 meals. We also rolled out this week our distance learning program. The distance learning program is uh, the best example I've ever seen of the true partnership between parents, teachers, and students for our students to realize a top education in the most difficult times. That distance learning uh, program is a tiered approach to distance learning, depending on the age level of our students, and it's multifaceted, including sending uh, work at home packets to all of our K through eight, eight year, eighth graders, uh, distributing technology to our middle and high school students, and where possible to the lower grades in our elementary schools. We have also had to acquire and distribute, distribute over a thousand MiFi units. We needed to actually order 700 of them, and because of the excellent work of our assistant superintendent for technology, she was able to acquire those for us in a very short time. In addition to the distance learning initiatives, we are also uh, very worried and focused on the social emotional supports for our students. And along those lines, we opened up this week an ability for families to schedule a 30 minute session with our school psychologists and social workers for their students. And so we, uh, please go on to the FCPS website to get more information about that. We're also working with our um, high school seniors to make sure that um, they can graduate on time albeit a very different graduation than what we all envisioned for them at the beginning of the year. We can talk a little bit more about that. Um, we will be starting next week in response to our county executive uh, putting forth a new budget. The school board and the superintendent will immediately start working on how schools will have to adjust their expectations as a result of the changing uh, landscape of the county budget. And with that, I wanted to make it short and sweet so that we could take questions. Excellent. Thank you. Did did you want did Dr. Braban, did he want to to add anything to or to provide any overview himself? Sure. Thank you, Supervisor Stork, and thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And it's so great to see both of you as leaders here in our school system and in the county reaching out to your community. Um, I think really Chairman Corbin Sanders has said it all. I'm very proud of our staff. We've been working very collaboratively with the county, including the county executive Ryan Hill and his leadership team and my leadership team to stand up food distribution sites, to provide technology distribution to our kids as we start distance learning. Um, I really just appreciate all of the outpouring of support. Our team has never been stronger. Our collaboration has never been stronger. And we're going to need to continue that strength moving forward as we uh, work through the challenges of COVID-19. And I want you to know, too, we're not only looking at the challenges before us, but we're also anticipating what additional educational supports we're going to need to provide students after this challenge has passed. 
But really, I think this is a great opportunity for question and answers, and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you or your folks uh, would like to. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand, and thank you, uh, Karen. I'm going to go to the questions. We have a we have a phone call to start, and um, you are on the virtual town meeting with uh, uh, Chairman Corbett Sanders, uh, Dr. Brabrand, myself, and uh, Dr. Gloria Atsu and Su. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Margarita. And I've been a resident of Fairfax County since 68. Um, I had a question about the education, but that the lady that was just talking answered me the questions. But I have another one. Where can I go to get a test for CO19? My doctor sends me to Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon sends me back to my doctor, so I really don't know. I'm not, uh, yes, please. So, but it, as I said earlier, um, there are challenges associated with testing. And instead of um, maybe going through what uh, the information that I already provided, if you could um, call our call center, I did, unfortunately, I don't have that number off hand, but on the Fairfax County Health Department's website, there is a number for our call center and someone at our call center will be able to help you. There are different um, areas within our community that is in increasingly um, beginning to provide testing. On the Route 1 um, corridor, I had mentioned that Neighborhood Health is providing testing, but it's only for patients. So I don't know if you're a patient at Neighborhood Health. Um, no, if, no, I haven't. No. Um, so I also mentioned about uh, Kaiser Permanente's um, Woodbridge and Tyson's drive-through no, locations. No, I get my Medicare, my doctors. Okay, so if you have a doctor's um, uh, referral, um, hope, hope maybe you might be able to obtain testing through Innova's three urgent care sites. One is the um, Dallas South. The other is North Allington, and the third is a Tyson's site where they are currently providing um, testing through their urgent cares. Again, if you're able to get that phone number, um, one of the callers, oh, sorry, one of the uh, people on the other end will be able to help you with this information. Thank you. Okay, and there was another question that I had but it was not for me. Uh, this is for a young, for a family uh, from out, out of country. Uh, they have been living here since uh, 2002. Uh, they render taxes every year since that year, 2002, starting in 2002, because the lawyer told them that they should go ahead and pay their taxes, and they have done it. In the meantime, after a few years, they had some two kids. Now, you know that the government has issued, uh, you know, the help that they are through this new law about the, um, uh, the Recovery Act or the, the Emergency Act for people that are unemployed. Uh, her husband works, and she works, and she just lost her, her job. But they're, they're no citizens. He has a green card. Will they get part of that money um, I know that the the act was just passed last week I I am not certain who will be getting the checks I know they're they're widespread I don't know if it's limited to to what residents it's limited to or not um, my advice if you want to send that uh, as an email question to us we will definitely I don't have an email the email is M T V E R. I'm sorry I don't have a computer. Okay. I don't have any technology. So, <laughs> Only okay. the phone that's, and the TV. That's okay. Could you, if you could, if you could call us, um, and the, the probably the best number to call us in is just call our our phone number now. We'll get it as a voicemail message, but we can get back with you and guide you to somebody who can help you. That phone number is 703-780-5500. Seven zero three. 
780-7518. And they'll, they'll just be a voicemail. Just leave a voicemail with your specific okay. information, and we will do our best to get back with you uh, in the next uh, day or two with, with whatever information, or at least to point you in the right direction. Okay, I've been going to your I've been going to your town halls all the time. Thank you very very much. It's a pleasure okay. to have you uh, come, and I'm glad to hear you today. Okay, thank you. Bye thank bye. you. We're now going to go to uh, to open the program to your questions. If you have questions, you can call 703-324-1114, which is again, if you have questions, you can call 703-324. 1114, or you can submit your questions to the Mount Vernon District email inbox, which is M T V E R N O N, that's Mount Vernon at fairfaxcounty.gov, or submit your questions by messaging me on Facebook, on our Facebook page at Supervisor Dan Stork, or on Twitter at Dan Stork. We now have an a online uh, uh, message and happy to take it. This is an email question from Kay, and she's asking if it would be possible to switch the school year around type schools like other countries have. I think maybe. Could you repeat that? She's asking about the school if we year. Could, could you repeat that, please? Sure. She's asking if we could switch the school year the way other countries have. I'm not sure what the. Oh, so the question is whether or not we're considering switching the school year to a year-round model yes. similar to other places in the world. Correct. Um, I know we've had discussions, and I'm going to allow Dr. Graybrand to provide some insights into that. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. Uh, the calendar that we have currently for this school year remains the same. We're actually beginning our spring break this uh, week to give our, our folks uh, uh, just a final chance to be ready to transition to the distance learning program. As far as the calendar for the next school year, the school board approved that almost a year ago. Uh, we've shared that out with families for several months. Um, and we'll look carefully at what additional options that we may need to support students after this COVID-19 crisis has passed. We are looking at summer school opportunities, but we have to be very mindful of the governor's executive order. Right now, the stay at home order is through June 10th. Summer school traditionally for Fairfax County Public Schools has not started until early July, so that remains a possibility, as well as doing something early in August before the start of the school year. Um, I'm not gonna rule anything out around the school calendar, and it's important uh, and Chairman Corbett Sanders knows this, that any school calendar decisions would come before the Fairfax County School Board for any final approval. So we're gonna look at everything, but right now there are no changes for this year's calendar or for next year's calendar. And Dr. Brayfriend, we do have a um, task force working on how to best address the needs for um, bridging the gaps and uh, making sure that we provide the best supports possible for mitigating the impact of this virus on the closure of our schools for our most at risk students. Absolutely. Correct? Absolutely. Our chief equity officer, Dr. Francisco Duran, has already put a team together and they're beginning to explore these very issues. And uh, once we've uh, pulled together some recommendations, we'll be bringing them for, forward to the school board for review and for community review and input. Excellent. Thank you. We now have a, we now have a phone call. Uh, you're joining the virtual uh, Mount Vernon Town Meeting. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much for taking my call. Um, my question is about high school. And it's very it's two quick questions. I want to know what is the district stand on teachers applying a late penalty for the third quarter work that students are allowed to make up. And also, so is there any consideration, I know fourth quarter is going to be a no mark. I do know some districts are, if students do on the digital work, complete at least 60% of the work, they're giving them a 100% for fourth quarter, and if they complete less than 60%, then they're getting a no mark. Those are my two questions. I hope it makes sense. 
Dan, would you mind repeating that? Because it was very hard to hear. I'm, I'm not sure I can repeat all of it. I know one, okay. ma'am, if you could just, why don't you repeat it and maybe if, speak a little bit more slowly. We have just, it's easier for us to hear you. And uh, if you wouldn't mind doing it again, that would probably be best for all of us. Okay. Um, what is this? Maybe I should turn off the TV. That, or turn it down. That would be very helpful. Yes. What is the district stance on teachers applying a late penalty for the third quarter work that the students are allowed to make up? Um, and also, in terms of fourth quarter grade being a no mark, I know some districts are allowing students, if they complete 60% of the digital work, to get a 100% for fourth quarter, and those students who complete less than 60% will get a no mark. So the question is about our grading policy and how that will be implemented in uh, with our distance learning. And Dr. Brabrand and his team briefed the school board last week on how the uh, grading policy would be implemented with distance learning. And at the guidance of the governor, we are closing out our third quarter um, as of March 12th, which was the last day the kids were in school. However, we are giving them the opportunity through April 24th to make up any work that had not already been submitted to um, do retakes and to demonstrate mastery of learning for the third quarter grade. We're encouraging all of our students to work closely with their teachers and their building administrators to make sure that they take advantage of this opportunity. <laughs> Concurrent with that, we're starting the fourth quarter on April 14th when our students return to learn. However, as you mentioned, that quarter will be a no mark quarter, which means that our children will be encouraged to participate in learning and to continue to demonstrate mastery, which can only improve their overall annual grade. It cannot um, diminish their grade for the year. Right, I understand that. What I was saying is in the high school, some of the teachers are, for that third quarter way of work that the students are making up that they may have missed, they're assigning a late penalty. As those, and I'm like, is that appropriate for them to assign a late penalty considering our circumstances? A late so penalty? So your question is about late work? She, she was saying, yes. that, yeah. There's well, a late, the late penalty. The students will have until April 24th to get all of their work in. And Dr. Brayman, do you want to... Um, expand upon this since you've been working very closely with Dr. Presidio on this. Sure. Uh, actually, you've summarized it quite well. The third quarter grade book remains open. It will remain open through April 24th. That's several weeks for folks to get in. Any remaining work that students didn't, didn't get to turn into the teacher and those things will be graded and there will be a third quarter grade assigned. Um, a lot of people have asked about report cards. Report cards for third quarter will go out shortly after April 24th. We want to give teachers time to have kids turn in those remaining assignments and to go ahead and have them graded and, and put in the grade book. Fourth quarter really is an opportunity for new instruction and new learning, but it will not hurt, only help students' grades. And fourth quarter work will inform students' overall final grade. So while you're hearing about a no mark for fourth quarter, all of the work done in fourth quarter will inform students' final grade with the provision that it will only help their grades, not hurt them. <coughs> so we're really, really pleased that this follows our own current Fairfax County Public Schools grading policy that's around mastery of learning uh, and around trending and letting students show even at the end of uh, fourth quarter their work on concepts to impact their overall grade and I want to remind a few folks too you may have say for example some seniors or even uh, underclassmen who were struggling before March 12th you still have time in fourth quarter to get that grade up 
to a passing grade. So even if your your child was struggling during this time, we're going to give every opportunity to support children to be able to get promoted, to pass the class, and to continue uh, to move forward. And those students that still have some struggles will be working to design the additional supports we already talked about, Dr. Duran and his team. We want every kid, regardless of this challenge before us, to continue to get a good education, a great education here in Fairfax, and to feel supported and get that support they need. If I can, I'm sorry. I, I, I do understand. I should say I'm a high school counselor in another school system. What I'm saying about the late penalty is I understand they have until April 24th, but students are making up missed work that they didn't have in third quarter. For example, if a student is making up an assignment from end of February that's part of third quarter, teachers are assessing a late penalty. What is this district's stand on, on that if you're allowing students to make up work from third quarter? So ma'am, this seems very specific to your own child and I would encourage you to uh, reach out directly to the principal of your child's school and please feel free to courtesy copy either Dr. Braybrand or I on that email um, referencing that you had posed this question during our town hall. But I know, uh, having spoken to all of our principals, that they are very focused on supporting the individual needs of each of our uh, students during this time. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you as well for calling. We have, uh, we have another phone call, and um, this is uh, the virtual town meeting. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Yes, good morning. Oh, oh hi. Um, I think there's a new vector for spreading the virus in Fairfax County that no one seems to be paying attention to. Um, I assume the governor's order, all non-essential businesses must shut. What about commercial lawn services? They're sending like three or four, sometimes five people to a job site in a pickup truck. Typically, they don't have hand or mask protection. Uh, I don't see how shoveling mulch is an essential service. And they're going from job site to job site. Uh, when the rest of us have to stay home, can't go to our jobs, the gym is closed, we can't use library services, I don't really see this as, a, and for that matter, um, the yard debris uh, pick up for which we pay taxes has been suspended and I can understand that but under those circumstances why are lawn service trucks coursing through the neighborhood uh, every day um, I as I understand the governor's uh, executive order uh, they have been permitted as an essential business. Um, now, whether or not they're practicing the, the appropriate social distancing, it sounds like that's, regardless that that's an issue. Um, I would um, I would just, uh, again, send, if you would send a uh, email to our office, that's probably the best way we would be happy to, to uh, follow up with, the, and if you know the particular company, the in specific details, we'd be happy to um, advise the, the police or others who are, are frankly having these conversations on a regular basis with companies and, and organizations, reminding them about the social distancing requirements. Those aren't, those aren't nice to do, those are requirements, as well as um, what, who and what the essential businesses are. But I believe that they are um, an essential business, so it'd be more a focus on the, the social distancing. Uh. I think the governor, frankly, needs to revise the, uh, his decree because there's no way they can uh, have social distance going from job site to job site and sometimes even just doing the job, getting the equipment out of the truck, etc. cetera. Um, so I would urge people to really think hard about it. And yes, I've already sent an email to your office well, thank you very uh, don't much. I don't know if complaining will do any good, but I just think this is just a glaring um, 
exception mm -hmm. that really, sh you know, it's just another vector to spread and increase the caseload. I, 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 I think your point's well taken, and I'd be more than happy to follow up and, and share and raise the same issues that you've just raised. I, it, it sounds like something is not being done consistent with what we all expect each of us to do. And why it matters, Dr. Gloria has spent a fair amount of time today talking about why it's important. Every single incident like this has a chance of spreading uh, coronavirus, and that is not in any of our interests at this point. So thank you very much for your call. We also have an online question. We have an email question for schools. We understand that, this is from Chris, we understand that graduation, prom, and other senior activities have been canceled and that you're planning other types of activities. Can you give more details, and do these events have to be canceled, or can they be postponed until later this summer? So, Dr. Brabrand, you sent a letter to all of our seniors earlier this week. If you want to address this uh, question, and then uh, I might add on to it. Sure. So, I, I think I've heard the question. Um, this, the simplest response right now, graduations have not been canceled at this time. I did send a letter to seniors saying with the governor's order through June 10th that graduation could be impacted. But in that same letter, I shared that the high school principals, all the high school principals and our leadership team and school board are committed to figuring out how we're going to do graduation, including alternative approaches, even virtual graduations if necessary. We're just going to have to continue to work with uh, the state and monitor the governor's orders. Um, we have some flexibility around the current scheduling of graduation. We're also going to look at alternatives to how we can do the graduation. So all options remain on the table. And I shared with seniors, I understand how disruptive the last uh, few weeks have been and that the next few months have been. But we're going to do everything we can to uh, make graduation happen in some shape or form and to recognize here at the end of the year their contributions uh, as students, and uh, we're all committed to doing that. And if I could just add a bit to that, um, parents of seniors, please understand, I know you know this better than all of us, but we share in um, their frustration and, and frankly, a, a grieving process, because this is the period of time in their high school, high school years where it's supposed to be celebratory and um, enjoying those last moments of sharing um, things like signing yearbooks and going to prom and having senior nights for each of our sports uh, sports teams that are finishing up their season. And all of those have been disrupted. So we are committed to finding other ways of recognizing and celebrating um, the successes of all of our kids. And if it is not in the traditional April, May, June timeframe, we are looking at other opportunities. Um, it may be in the fall um, or when our kids return from, uh, from college at winter break, we will work with you to find ways of celebrating these kids' kids' successes. Thank you. We have another uh, online question. So a question from Kathy for schools. Can you tell us if the schools are, that are currently under construction are in a holding pattern, or is that work still being done and moving forward? So this is our capital improvement, our renovations, um, and things like that for our schools? Yes. Dr. Brabrand, I know that we are um, looking to approve some of those contracts soon. Do you want to address that? Yeah, you know, I don't have an answer that I could share with you today. I know that building in terms of um, nationwide, that building has been, uh, construction has been deemed an essential activity, but I don't know the specifics for Fairfax County Public Schools uh, right off the cuff this morning. I'll check with our Assistant Superintendent, Jeff Plannenberg, and we can include that in one of the FAQs. And that's just a reminder, lots of our questions that are coming in, we're putting up at www.fcps.edu. We really encourage everyone to take a look at that website and get your questions answered, and we'll put a answer up about that very shortly. Thank you. And, and um, I think that's a great uh, 
great reminder about the website, www.fcps.edu, and that'll have a lot more information than what we could possibly cover in our town meeting today. So please don't hesitate to go there. We have, a, we have another phone call. This is the virtual town meeting, Mount Vernon virtu virtual town meeting. Welcome. Uh, hello, Dan. Yes, good morning. Yes, Dan, I wanted to start out by saying it's, a, it's an honor for us to have, to, to have you as our supervisor. And thank you for setting up this virtual town meeting for us. Well, uh, thank you. As a long time uh, resident in Riverside Gardens, it's also a, an honor to have you as a, as a neighbor. Thank you. Oh, okay, Dan, is, my question would be this, or comment. As you mentioned earlier in our meeting, not everyone is following the social distancing guidelines. And two places it is especially apparent that folks are not following the guidelines are at the Fairfax County Public School school athletic facilities and the Fairfax County Park Authority playgrounds. And I feel that these places are going to be breeding grounds for the COVID-19 in our county. Also, I think this noncompliance with the guidelines will only increase as the weather improves. I'd suggest that the Fairfax County Public Schools and Fairfax County Park Authority put up signs and caution tape and lock the gates to the fields to discourage community use of these facilities. I don't know about all the parks and schools in Fairfax County, but at the Carl Sandburg Intermediate School, there are several athletic fields, as, as, I, know you, as I know you're well aware of, Dan, because I've seen yes. you jogging there. Yes. And the, all the fields are wide open and being used. Also, the fields at Fort Hutt Elementary are wide open. Also, in the Stratford Landing Park, the playground facilities are wide open and are being used by, 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 by kids and, and adults over there with the kids. Now, I know that putting up signs, caution tape, and locking the gates to the fields is not a perfect solution, but I feel it would discourage some folks from using these facilities, and that would definitely be a step in the right direction. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, thank you for your call, and I think there's a, probably a couple of different uh, folks you need to respond to that. Let me start first with Dr. Gloria. In general, Dr. Gloria, um, children at playgrounds, um, can they play by themselves or a family member, or, or is that uh, not right? Or is it just a matter of the social distancing on the playground itself? Because of touching equipment, does that bother, uh, matter? And then we'll go to, I'd love to hear from the schools as well. So, so definitely, social distancing is paramount. It's being more than six feet apart. The tricky part about kids playing is that, you know, if the um, equipment that they're using, the, the, the playground equipment is not cleaned in between them, mm -hmm. then even when you social distance, you know, kids, depending on how old they are, kids they could be kids. licking, yeah. um, you know, equipment mm -hmm. or, uh, and so on, which could be um, pro problematic. So one of the things that maybe this moving forward with the CDC recommendation for face coverings, um, it, it might be helpful to limit some of the um, potential exposures that might happen, except that you know, kids less than two years is not recommended for mm -hmm. them. So or to, to wear a mask yeah, less than two years. That's, that's correct. So um, it, which, is, which is what makes the stay at home order important mm -hmm. because um, even though you can social distance in some settings, you can't uh, ensure frequent cleaning um, of these high touch surfaces and which could then you know, cause a problem. So basically discourage and prefer that um, parents not bring their children to playgrounds and not have their children play at playgrounds because of the, the frankly, the risk that there is somebody who, who was ill was there and they put their hands on the same playground equipment, you know, an hour or two hours or, you know, and even 24 hours later. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if playgrounds um, could be wiped um, in between use, like we do at the gym, um, that could be helpful, but it's, mm -hmm. it's almost impractical and not everybody will, will do it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think if, you know, several kids that their family members know each other um, were to be at a playground setting, 
in which social distancing is, 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 is practiced and there is cleaning so that the kids are utilizing different parts of the playground mm -hmm. equipment that would be safe. But it's almost, if you can't do that um, and ensure that cleaning, mm -hmm. then the, it's better for the kids not to be um, in that setting at all. The public settings, yes. That's, that's correct. Yeah. And, 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 uh, so Dan? Yes, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Dan, this is an area where um, there's been great collaboration between Fairfax County uh, Public Schools, the Park Authority, um, and frankly, the County Executive and Dr. Braybrand. We, two weeks ago, um, raised this concern and made sure that there were um, notices put up. It took a bit of time to get them all up at both our parks because sometimes we have facilities that may be adjacent to a school and people think they're part of the school, but they're actually part of the park service or the community um, the services. And so we have been working to get everything marked, but this is an area where we really have to work collaboratively with the community in asking the community to cooperate and not utilize our um, facilities in large groups. This past weekend at Bryant um, Alternative School, there was a group of about 20 kids who were all playing basketball and um, enjoying our facilities. And that is not helpful for those students or those kids, nor is it helpful for the community. And so what we are encouraging people to do is practice those um, social distancing guidelines uh, no matter how old you are. They're important guidelines for your own physical health, but also for the health of everybody else in the community. Well said, and I, and I think particularly your point, uh, Chairman uh, Corbett Sanders, is that there isn't always a clear line between park authority or for that matter, neighborhood and community services locations and school locations that we frankly have done a wonderful job as it really we started the conversation of how we partner together, how we utilize facilities between all the different uh, organizations, frankly, for the benefit of our community, which is who we wanna try to always serve. So we have, uh, we have uh, another online question. Yes, we have an email question from Mika. I'm just seeing the distance learning plans and it feels overwhelming with two young school students and working parents. Will there be an opportunity for parents and teachers to give feedback on the success or failure of distance learning? And also, is there any polling being done on how equitable the distance learning is? Even if kids get computers, not all home situations will be equal. It's an excellent question. Um, Scott, do you want to start and then I can add on if necessary? Sure, I think I've heard a little bit about it. We certainly recognize how overwhelming this feels to do uh, distance learning, it's completely different and it does not replicate day-to-day face-to-face instruction in Fairfax County Public Schools. We've said that and I think we need to continue to say it even as we begin this distance learning. This is doing the best that we can do in the crisis that we have with COVID-19. Um, it is overwhelming uh, for many of our families to try to be working uh, in the home and trying to supervise their kids for education. We recognize that. Um, so we're gonna want to take your feedback. Please start by giving your teachers feedback, reaching out and giving the principals feedback. And we are going to continue to do this in a spirit of monitoring and adjusting this learning plan as we go along. Uh, we really have tried to balance the amount of on-time screen time that our kids are getting. Some of the time is going to be teacher virtually led instruction. Some of the time is gonna be teacher supported instruction. And sometimes it's just gonna be independent work and activities that have nothing to do with getting on a computer. And as Chairman Corbett Sanders said, for K through eighth grade, we actually have learning packets that will be mailed out in this first week. And then parents will have the ability to opt out if they don't want to require having it be mailed. They can simply access it online. Uh, but it is going to be a learning process for all of us and reach out when you need help and recognize it's not going to be perfect and i think here we can't let perfect be the enemy of the, of the good for our teachers 
We try to tell teachers it's not going to be perfect. We need to say the same thing to parents. And I encourage you, too, to do something that Chairman Corbett Sanders mentioned earlier. We are offering outreach to a school psychologist or social worker for at least 30 minutes. There's information about that on our website at www.fcps.edu. And we're going to get through this together, and we're going to do the best we absolutely can to continue to provide education for your children during this time. And we're all going to have to just endure a little bit of change and work together and make it uh, the best change that it can be. Thank you, Scott. I would also suggest that it's okay to feel overwhelmed. We are all feeling a bit overwhelmed. But what we need to ensure for everybody is that they have accesses, access to the resources to help them address these, uh, these feelings and have the tools in their toolbox to be able to best meet their needs of their families and their students. Along those lines, I would also urge people to, um, to take the time to have some family time, some uh, time to actually work on independent projects that are not driven by the, um, the curriculum of the distance learning because it will be important for um, our own mental health to have those periods of mindfulness and um, distraction. I would I would say that's very well said, and one that maybe harkens us back to an earlier time where uh, we did. This gives us that time, more family time, and in some cases maybe more family time than what we really would like. But but the flip side of that is you you will learn and engage and and frankly discover other parts of the relationship that maybe had kind of been. Uh, put in the background because we were so focused on the day-to-day -day or so focused on the particular media or device that we were we were working with. So we have another phone call. Yes, you are, welcome to the virtual town meeting. You're welcome to the Mount Vernon uh, virtual town meeting. Um, still can't quite hear you. If you could repeat your if you could start over again, please. Okay. We're not able to hear you, so we're going to go on to a um, online question. This is an email question for schools from Andy. He says, if the students still had books and workbooks, the continuity of learning would not have been interrupted. Why did you take away students' hardcover books and related workbooks? So the question is, why have we eliminated um, student workbooks in our elementary and uh, middle school uh, curriculum? And um, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, including the availability of them. I'm going to let Dr. Braybrand address how curriculum has changed over time in light of um, our textbook manufacturers really changing the way they deliver their product. Yes, thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. There have been changes in uh, the materials that we've used for both elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I could get more specific information to your question. Uh, frankly, a lot of the information has been content area driven, whether it's science, math, English, social studies, in terms of what is offered. We have been committed. We've had a community task force that's been a part of selecting our instructional materials, led by Dr. Sloan Presidio, our Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Resources. And uh, we continue to want to hear community support for the kind of materials that we're giving kids. A lot of the materials actually have shifted to be online and digital materials, which is really helping us right now. Um, but we certainly appreciate your feedback, and uh, I would offer that you could share this feedback with your school's principal, and we'll share it with Dr. Presidio and the instructional team here in Fairfax as we move forward. And additionally, we are sending to all of the homes work packets, which will essentially be uh, like workbooks for our kids. Well, thank you both. Uh, we have another uh, online question. 
Tracy um, asked us a question earlier, and she's now wondering, Karen, if you can provide your email address for the follow-up email. Um, she's found Dr. Braybrands. Your personal, your uh, school board email address? Oh, it's super, superintendent at fcps.edu. Correct, Scott? That's correct. And, and uh, uh, Chairman and Corbusier, mine yes. Uh -huh. Is K L C O R B as in boy E T T S A N at fcps.edu. Okay. Thank you. And we have a, another online question. Um, Chairman Sanders, can you tell us about a little bit about the school feeds program and how well it's going and or if there are any more plans to expand? The school, I didn't quite hear that either, so. The school feed, the program oh, to feed foodie, students foodie during program. this time. Can you just tell us oh, a little bit about? the feeding program. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are 34 sites as well as a bus distribution. Families are able to access the grab-and-go meals between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., Monday through Friday. It will continue next week during spring break and afterwards when we resume our distance learning. If you have a question as to where those sites are, you can go online at fcps.edu and there is a link to all of the sites. Here in Mount Vernon, and the Mount Vernon and Lee area, we have Bucknell Elementary, Cameron Elementary, Edison High School, Fort Belvoir Upper School on the uh, military base, Hybla Valley Elementary School, Lorton Station Elementary School, Mount Vernon Woods Elementary School, South County High School, Audubon, Gum Springs Community Center, and the Mount Eagle Elementary School. Thank you. We have, uh, we have, uh, we have another phone call. This will be our last phone call before we um, will need to conclude our, our virtual town meeting. Yes, you're on the Mount Vernon District uh, virtual town meeting. There, I think. Ask her what her question is. Oh, can you can you be specific as to your question? I'm sorry, we can barely hear you, but if you could just be very clear about the specific question you'd like for us to answer. Yes, I'm sorry, we we we're not able to hear your question at this time. You're welcome to send us your question via email, and we will um, absolutely get back with you. Uh, and with that. Um, I do thank you all uh, for your great questions, uh, but that's all the uh, time that we have uh, today for that. I'd especially like to thank uh, my guest, Dr. Dr. Gloria. Thank you for being here thank today. Uh, and and uh, uh, Chairman Corbett Sanders, thank you very much for being here today. And Dr. Braban, Superintendent of Schools, thank you very much, sir. Um, we had a, a lot of questions and obviously a lot of keen interest on all of, on everybody's part about what's going on and how does this fit into these extraordinary times that we're living in. Um, I'm sorry, if we didn't get to your question, we will respond to them as soon as possible. And please don't hesitate to email those questions to us. Uh, as we close, I want to remind each of you to stay in your homes as much as possible. Stay six feet away from others when you're out. And of course, the proverbial, wash your hands. Uh, wash your hands more times than you ever imagined. But that it does make a huge difference. And check out the county website and our Get Help, Give Help webpage for more ways you can help. 
Always, for more information on COVID-19, please call our office at 703-780-7518, or you're absolutely welcome to email our office at mtvernon at fairfaxcounty.gov. You can also visit the county website at fairfaxcounty.dot fairfaxcounty gov uh, forward slash COVID-19 and the health department website at fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash health, as well as you can always um, do the same with the www.fcps.edu website. And don't forget to sign up for text message alerts, texting FFXCOVID, you text FFXCOVID to the number 888777. Again, thank you for joining us today and please be safe and be well and wash your hands and be socially distant. Thank you.